You'll notice this morning there's only two readings. Actually, there should probably only be one, but we do a gospel reading because we do communion. And the rules say that you should do a gospel reading when you do communion. So we kind of follow the rules. Some, Believe it or not, I actually follow the rules sometimes. So... Um, but we've switched lectionaries. Normally, and this is just a little sidetrack here, it's just so you can understand some things. Normally we use what's called the Revised Common Lectionary, which is a three-year cycle that leads us through the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, with John thrown in during Easter and Lent. Um, but we've switched it up a little bit here in the summer, and we're using what's called the Narrative Lectionary, which takes us, is, it's a four-year cycle, which takes us on a story basis through the, all of the Bible. Um, it starts in September and runs through May, and it starts in Genesis, and then it runs through one of the Gospels. It runs through the Old Testament until Christmas, and then at Christmas it switches over to the New Testament, which is actually the way we should do it, right? Because the Old Testament leads up to Jesus' birth, and at Christmas we switch over to Jesus, and we talk about Jesus through His death and resurrection. So, But during the summer they do these little short snippets, and the, the series for the next four weeks is on the book of Ephesians. And I, I was intrigued by it because I saw some people post some things. So we're going to, for the next four weeks, do a series in the book of Ephesians called Sitcom Theology. So some of you younger members are not going to know these, sto- these shows at all. Adults, this is for you. Today we're doing Fresh Prince of Bel-Air Theology. From the book of Ephesians. Ruthie looks a little concerned. (laughs) Trust me, this one will be good. The book of Ephesians starts out... um, Bill gave us a wonderful introduction into the book of Ephesians. The only thing that I might add to that is that it might not have actually been written by Paul, but might have been written by somebody who highly idealized Paul and wanted to write in Paul's writing style. Um, There's several books in the New Testament that are attributed to Paul that Paul didn't write. Um, It's just the way it works. But this author starts and says, you know, called by Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to all of you saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the whole world to be holy and blameless before Him in love. He destined us for adoption as His children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace that He freely bestowed on us in His beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace that He lavished on us with All wisdom and insight He has made known to the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure that He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in Him and in things heaven and things on earth in Christ. We also have obtained an inheritance. Now, I read that a lot faster than Bill did. And I read it as a straight through run on sentence because that's actually the way that it's written. In your version, you can read it. It's got periods and it's got commas. In the original writing, it's one big long sentence. And how does that work? What does all of that mean? And how can we have an inheritance in Christ? How many of us are actually related to, to Jesus? Let me ask that question again. How many of us are related to Jesus? Oh. Yeah, really, you should raise your hand. <laughs> It's a trick question, right? Because actually none of us are, but all of us are, right? It's a trick question. So how do we have an inheritance? Because God said he was going to give it to us. We've been destined for adoption. We are his children. That's why we have an inheritance. He said we were his children before the foundation of the world Before anything else was set into motion, he knew you were going to be here this day and he knew that he was going to call you and claim you as his child. He knew that. Right? It's that it's that old adage. How many of you have ever been talking to somebody and they have a kid and that kid is a surprise? 
Right? Have you heard that? Yeah. It's a surprise. We weren't planning on having a kid. There's a, there, I was listening to some commentaries about this particular text this past weekend, and one of them had, one of the commentators was talking, and she said that she remembered seeing a TV show once, and she didn't mention the name of the TV show, so it's not Fresh Prince of Bel-Air yet. So, but she said on this TV show that the grandparents told this daughter that their mother, that her mother had said that she was a surprise or a mistake or worded in some way. And when the mother talks to the daughter, the mother didn't refute what the grandmother said, that she was that the, that the child was a surprise. But what she said to the child was, um, I loved you before you were born, and now I love you even more. So even if it was a surprise, I still loved you before you came, and today I love you even more than when I found out about you. That's the way that God looks at each and every one of us. Because He knew us before we were born. And He watches us do the things that He's called us to do. And helps us to live as His child. Now to the, the theology of Will Smith. Sounds kind of weird. Those of you that... The, how many people here know the show? So I know how much background I have to give. Okay, for those of you that don't know the show, Will Smith is a is a... Is, grows up in Philadelphia with his mother. His father left them when he was really young. And so he's getting into the trouble in Philadelphia. So his, his mother sends him to live with his aunt and his uncle in Bel Air, California. Right? So he's kind of adopted, if you will, by his uncle and his aunt to live there so that he can grow up in a house and away from trouble. Well, in this particular episode, which happens in season three, season four, the, towards the end, this episode aired May 8th, 1994. How old were you then? 21? <laughs> 16. Who said 16? <laughs> I'm going to let that one go. Man, this was this episode, season four, episode 24. In this season, Will's father actually comes back. He comes to find him in Bel Air because I guess he talked to his mother and he knew that Will had gone to live with his uncle and his aunt in Bel Air. So his father shows up after being gone for so long and he says he's going to take Will on a trip and they're going to go and they're going to do some father-son bonding. And then about the middle of the show comes and the father gets a call and he's got another deal Another business deal to go take care of. So he's talking with, with Will's uncle about how he has to leave. And he tries to leave before Will sees him. And Will comes in carrying his bags and his dad says, I've got to go. Well, God, we just have to postpone our trip for like two weeks. I'll call you next week and we'll plan everything. And the dad says, it was great seeing you, Will. And Will says, it was great seeing you too, Lou. His father leaves and he turns around and he's, he looks at his uncle and he says, you know, you know, his uncle says to him, it's okay, it's okay, I wish I could do something for you. And Will starts to say, i got to look at my thing here. Um, Will responds by pulling a present that he had bought for his dad out of, his, out of a gym bag and says he wished he hadn't wasted his money on this present for his father. And then his uncle says, you know, there's, it's okay to be angry it's okay if I wish I could do something for you. And Will then starts to say, you know, well, at least this time he said goodbye, other than the last time where he just left me and mom. And at least I'm not five sitting up after every night asking my mom, where's dad, when is dad coming home? You know, I was able to learn how to shoot my first basket without him. I was able to, to go on my first date without any help from him. I was able to learn how to drive without any help from him. I was able to learn how to shave without any help from him. I was able to learn how to fight without any help from him. And for 14, I had 14 great birthdays without him. And he never, ever sent even a simple little card. He's ranting and raving to his uncle. And his uncle tells him it's okay to be mad and it's okay to be upset. And then Will goes on to say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm, I've done all of this stuff without him. I don't need him. 
I'm going to get to, I'm going to get through college without him. I'm going to get a great job without him. I'm going to get married without him. I'm going to have a whole bunch of kids without him. And I'll be a better father than he ever was because there's, there's surely nothing that he could ever teach me about how to love my children. And then at that moment, he just stops and stands. And it's just the two of them, um, Will and his uncle Phil, standing there looking at each other. And Will says to his uncle, How come he don't want me? How come he don't want me? He falls into his uncle's arms and they both just cry. And the credits roll. And as the credits roll, they pan off to to the present that Will had bought for his father. And the present that he had bought for his father was, was an image, was a statue. And it was an image of a man cradling a, a child sitting on the floor. He was sitting like cross-legged on the floor, cradling the child in his arms and in his lap. And that's exactly what Ephesians says that God does to each and every one of us. That he's destined us for adoption as his children. That he's there to give us everything that we've ever needed. That he is going to give us an inheritance beyond all comparison. And he's there to cradle us in his arms. We're never going to say, why doesn't he want me? Because he always wants us. Regardless of what we do or where we go. God is always going to be there. To show us the way. To be his children. And to show us the love that he has for each and every one of us. So remember that he has given you grace and riches and lavished them on you and called you his child. And has given and has destined you for adoption to be a brother and sister with Christ. So don't ever question whether God wants you because he does. And he'll always be there to help you along the way.